everybody. Welcome to the Digging Deeper podcast. My name is Lindsay Knuckles. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. I'm filling in for your beloved host, Stacy, And I'm here with my friend, Todd Lesher. You guys have met him before. Good to be here. Good to be back. Yes, he's our family ministry team lead. Todd, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so we have been in a series on Sunday morning. It's called Are We There Yet? And we've been taking a journey through 1 John. Um, so let's get started. And Jason started off his message this past week by talking about the destination. Yep. So where we're going. Um, as defined by John. And so he said, we're going towards a confidence and an assurance of our eternal life. Can you unpack that a little bit? And what does that mean to have a confidence and assurance of eternal life? Yeah, I think the first thing that comes to mind, it's confidence in promise and quality. Mm -hmm. And so I think to make it relevant to our day and age at this point is we have, we put our confidence in in the quality of something, uh, the promise and quality of something, uh, just by brands alone, you think of people who are fanatics about Apple products or Patagonia or Chacos. You know, yeah. they buy that item or clothing or whatever it may be because there was a promise that it's going to be quality. And they believed it and they wore it or they used it. Yeah. And they were like, I'm not going to use anything else. I'm never going to buy anything else. So it fulfilled on the promise and they're going to use it for the rest of the time or as long as they're alive. So when it comes to this guarantee that we have that John is writing about in his letter is that we can have confidence in the fact that we will have eternal life, Mm -hmm. which Jason has unpacked a little bit over the past two weeks. It's both a future reality and a present reality. It's a way of life. Eternal life is a way of life and it is future life, Mm -hmm. life forever. But we put our confidence in the promise and quality of the person who gave us that eternal life. Yeah, that's good. And I think that is what we find in Jesus. And so there's a, there's a scripture in Matthew 16, 21, uh, one of the gospel accounts. And it says, uh, from that time on, Jesus began explaining to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Mm. So from here, we see that Jesus talk, apparently talked openly about his death and his resurrection. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we can put our trust and confidence in a person who predicts their death and resurrection and then pulls it off. Yep. And there's biblical accounts and extra biblical accounts that talk about the resurrected Jesus. Yeah. And so that's, that's where good. I'm going to put my confidence yeah, in the good. one who said, hey, you're not just going to be forgiven. I'm not just going to be with you, but you can have eternal life. Yeah, that's good. Well, I think we can trust someone who mm-hmm. died and rose again because they said they would. Yeah, that's good. When you're talking about product, that reminded me in my brain, something that I don't have confidence in. Okay. That's my car. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I have like a moment, a PTSD moment where my Jeep yeah. and you are a part of that. Yep. It broke down mm-hmm. and it died. So yeah. every time I get in my new car, and by new I mean it's old, it's 2004 Volvo, yeah. I'm like, this I, This is not going to get me to point B, yeah. point A to point B. It's not going to get me there. Um, and it's like an adventure. Every mm-hmm. ride is an adventure. Mm-hmm. But when you're talking about quality, I'm like, I do not have confidence in my car. Right. Well, <laughs> and I don't have confidence that, in fixing it. That, that, you know, anything that we put our confidence yeah. in, yeah. if we over spiritualize anything, yeah. we're like, oh, I can't trust Jesus because my Jeep breaks down. <laughs> it's like, well, what if? sure, our iPhones are going to break. Yeah. You know, the technology is going to be limited in some way. Yeah. And so it's not a complete analogy, but th- sure. I think that happens all the time. Yeah. It's like, I get frustrated at the makers of my car because yes. it breaks down. I was like, yeah. you said my car would never break. <laughs> but or myself because I have no confidence in fixing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that. Uh, well, what's something you have confidence in or assurance of? Okay, so uh, <laughs> when I hear this question, the first thing that comes to my mind is I am 100% confident okay. that my youngest son mm. is going to wake up at 6 o'clock or before every single day. Mm. He is never going to sleep in. Like and we've kind of programmed him mm. probably for that to wake mm. up early, but he can't get out of bed until 6.20. He's got this little watch that he wears, but guarantee that door opens to the family room it's at like 620. It's alarm clock. Clockwork. I am mm-hmm. confident in that. Do I'm also think? confident in the sun rising. Okay. That it's it, living here in the Carolinas, we get yep. beautiful view of the sunrise most days. You know, if you live in, I don't know, Seattle or mm-hmm. the <laughs> northwest of the United States, you probably don't see the sun very often, but it's still shining. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's doing what it does, so I'm confident in that. 
I'm also pretty confident, and this is probably just insecurity and the reality that I am going to let people down. Mm. <laughs> Me too. I hate Amen. to admit that about myself. I, I make well, plenty of mistakes to and to get yeah. like, you know, I will sin. I'm confident in those yep. things. So there yep. you go. There from you go. Yep. the lighthearted to the serious. serious. Well, you've let but us. get real. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've let us right into the topic there today. Go. We're talking about sin. Um, so let's start off simple. Let's just define it. Okay. Uh, so what is sin? Um, I'm going to read what Jason said yep. um, from this past Sunday. Uh, so Jason defined it as an enemy and destroyer of all that God intended. Mm -hmm. So anything we do, say, and think that's not what God intended, and anything that we do or don't think, don't say, and don't do, that is that is what God intended. Right. It's a little bit confusing to get out. Yep. Um, so can you break that down for us? Well, I think anytime that a pastor at Forest Hill particularly uses mm -hmm. the phrase God intends, mm -hmm. What they're referring to is some of the first pages of the Bible. So yep. in our Bible, we have the Old Testament, the New Testament. New Testament can also be referred to as the Hebrew Scriptures. Yep. And the first book of the Bible is the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. uh, a little rabbit trail. Often people go, oh, where do I start reading the Bible? Oh, it must be like every other book. I'll start at Genesis. Yep. That's where you would start. You don't have to do that when you read the Bible. That's good. But in the opening pages of Genesis, we get an idea of God's original intent for people mm -hmm. and for the world. Yep. So anytime that someone like Jason mentions that when we do something, think something, say something, that is not what God intends, mm -hmm. they're referring back to Genesis chapter good. 1 and 2. That's good. And if they're saying, if we don't do something, don't say something, or don't think something that God intends mm -hmm. for us, then it's the flashback. Yep. to Genesis 1 and 2. and But the thing about Genesis 1 and 2 is it's not overt. We get this idea mm -hmm. that God created everything, and he said that it was good. Mm -hmm. Then he created human beings, mm -hmm. man and woman, and he said they're very good. And then he put them in the garden to take care of mm -hmm. the planet mm -hmm. and I think take care of each other. Yeah, and good. then there was this implied relationship with God. But along with those directions, however explicit or implicit uh, that we find them, there was one boundary, one limit mm -hmm. to that, and that there's this tree of life in the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, yep. and th the latter was the one that they're not supposed to eat from. Mm -hmm. And so when the serpent enters the garden, whatever he was doing, or she was doing, I don't know, mm -hmm. it was always, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, when, whenever they come into the garden, and tempt Adam and Eve, that is when they sin. Yep. The temptation is not the sin, but when they choose to act out of, yeah, outside good. of God's intention, they have done what God didn't intend for them to do. Yeah, that's good. They didn't do what God did intend and for them. Yeah, that's good. So it's acting out. Yeah, Here, here's kind of a summary yeah, that, good. that helps. John Stott uh, is a, a scholar from, I think, Great Britain, England, something like that. But uh, he summarizes it this way. He says, sin is either an ideal which we fail to reach or a law which we break. Yeah, that's good. Well, how do we, this could be a broad question, but how do we learn to recognize sin in our lives? What does it look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay. Well, uh, the first one is just kind of a little more detail mm -hmm. here is we were made to love God and love people. Yes. If you want to summarize yep. what, I think even Jesus pulled out of God's original intent mm -hmm. in the Garden of Eden, the original creation, and then when he started to explain, okay, what's the greatest command? Yep. Well, God intended for us to love him first and to love people as an yeah. overflow of that love for him. So when we sin, we fail to love God mm -hmm. and love people. So just a couple examples. Idolatry is a sin of loving something more than God. Yep. Idolatry the word idol in there is putting something in place of God. Yeah. Uh, abuse, any form of abuse, yes. is sin of withholding love mm -hmm. from someone. Mm -hmm. Okay, And some would say it's the abuse of love yep. on someone. And then pride is the sin of loving ourselves above everything else. Yeah. So that's it, what we uh, fail to love God or fail to love mm -hmm. people or fail to love ourselves in yeah. the appropriate way. So I think the best way to recognize yeah sin in in or when it's 
out in the open yeah. is just look at Facebook mm. uh, when you're in traffic or when students are at yes, school. Yes. I mean, I think yeah. <laughs> there's some pretty blatant examples in those environments. And you just look at it and go, okay, yeah. the, the arguments that take place between people yeah. on Facebook, that's not what God intended. Mm-hmm. You know, if Facebook yeah. was in the Garden of Eden, yeah. it would have been a little bit different. It would have been a little more hon- harmonious yeah. than it is. But if you just drop anything that could incite a disagreement or division, mm-hmm. There is just an evidence of sin mm-hmm. in that place. Or when you're in traffic mm-hmm. and people are waving mm-hmm. at each other with one finger, you know, it's yeah. something's going on. <laughs> yes. That's not, it's yep. not the greeting that yep. we should extend to yep. one another. Yep. And then I just, at being in student ministry, I think in middle mm-hmm. school all the time. And yep. there are so many stories yep. that I've heard throughout the years of the effects of sin in the hallways, in the locker rooms, and now over social media or texting or anonymous apps or whatever it may be where you see, oh, this is the evidence of those things. But it plays out is when we fail to love God Mm -hmm. or love people as Mm -hmm. he intended. And I just gave a few of those examples uh, to set that up. Yeah. Well, I mean, you talked about loving God, loving people. What actually happens when we don't do that? How does it affect our relationship with one another, our relationship with the Lord? Well, I think... a few of them, and Jason mentioned yeah. two in his message mm-hmm. uh, this past weekend, but uh, it creates a division and death. Yep. But it also, p- part of division is separation. Yeah. There's a distance formed. It also breaks trust, causes yeah. shame, and it brings about guilt. Yeah. So those are some of the effects of sin. Yeah. Man, I don't want to be somebody that brings death right. and division. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yep. And I think I was talking to somebody over lunch last week. And they were talking about how we were talking about how sin in our lives and mine in particular, when it's not dealt with and it's there and I haven't confessed, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, how that overflow affects other people, how that brokenness, that effect. um, If I live by pride, if I live by shame, Mm -hmm. um, other people will feel that Mm -hmm. um, because I'm not in line um, with the Lord. So that was hard to hear. um, And I don't I don't want to be a person that brings division and um, death to Mm -hmm. people. But that's what happens when we haven't addressed that. So. Um, well, let's unpack um, verse 6. Okay. Jason kind of brought up two issues. Um, mm-hmm. We're in First John um, 1, 6, um, following along. Um, so he brought up two issues. The first is it says, we can't say, God, you and I are good. Hey, mm-hmm. we're on the same page. We're doing great. But then live any way we want. Yep. Um, and the second is that truth is not relative. There is a true way to live. There is a right and there is a wrong. Can you unpack these for us, and why are these? Yeah, fun topics. Fun <laughs> topics. Know, like, Our culture light. loves this <laughs> when we get into this <laughs> realm here. Yep. I'll read the, the verse from <laughs> First John uh, okay. this is, uh, yeah, 1, good. verse 6. It says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, so the fellowship is that relationship, yes. that connection with God through our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and mm-hmm. do not live by the truth. Mm-hmm. So it's essentially mm-hmm. there's some hypocrisy or there's a paradox here to go, oh, yes, I have fellowship with God, but I'm living yeah, in a way that he does not intend. He didn't create mm-hmm. for me to live. Mm-hmm. So here's the thing. When we choose to follow Jesus, what we are saying, what that phrase means when someone says, I'm a Christian or I'm a follower of Jesus or if they pray the prayer, you know, whether mm-hmm. it's at summer camp or something like that, or if you have made the decision to be baptized, mm-hmm. what all of those things ultimately are saying is that my life belongs to you, mm-hmm. that I want Jesus to be the king of my life. I will trust you, submit to you, and obey you. Yeah. Again, I, I think sometimes our culture would like to remove those words mm-hmm. from our vocabulary because they require giving up our autonomy to someone else. And again, if we go back to what we said at the beginning, yeah. it's confidence in the promise and quality yes. of the person mm-hmm. that we are placing our trust in. Yeah, that's good. And so it, to me, it all sounds very vow-like, mm. is that we are making this commitment to Jesus who paid the ultimate price by laying down his life so that we could have an everlasting relationship that he holds firm. Yeah, that's good. I mean, you get into some of Paul's writing, and it, he'll tell us that God is the one who holds our faith firm in Christ. Mm-hmm. And so he's the covenant keeper. And because of our sin, 
we will continue to wrestle with the effects of that, but it does not break the covenant yeah, relationship yeah. that we have. Uh, another, another thing that uh, Jason mentioned was it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to say yes to Jesus and then live however you want to. Mm-hmm. It, someone says that's, that's taking advantage of yeah. the, the commitment that you have made to him or the price that he has paid for mm-hmm. you. He, he, Jason mentioned the idea of taking a job and then saying, I'm not going to oh, show right, up for work. Right. I think another example, yeah. uh, which is, is just breaking down um, mm-hmm. nowadays, is mm-hmm. the marriage example yeah. where you make this, you make vows to one another to be there for better, for worse, mm-hmm. for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. I pledge myself to you, to your spouse. And so yeah, this is why right. things like prenups yep. and uh, uh, swingers, right, <laughs> like when it right. comes to, to marriage, th- it starts to deteriorate the strength of that example. Yeah. But you don't go into marriage, and I'll say this in some of the marriage counseling I do, mm. is you don't go into marriage planning for divorce. Yeah. But that happens yeah. sometimes. Yeah. But the reason we don't go into marriage like that is because we have no intentions mm-hmm. to do that. We plan to uphold our vows. Yeah. But the thing about the difference between a marriage yeah. vow and then the, the our relationship with God, again, is he's the covenant mm-hmm. keeper, whether or not uh, we break it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's yeah, plenty of good. scriptures in here. Uh, yeah. uh, the Apostle Paul mentions in mm-hmm. Romans uh, six fifteen, he says, should we go on sinning because we're not under the law, but we're mm-hmm. under grace? He says, by no means. Yeah. Grace should motivate us yeah, to choose to deny sin or to resist yeah. temptation. That's good. Thank you for explaining that. Um, this is a little bit of a personal question. Okay. Um, but I would love if you could share uh, maybe where sin has had a hold on your life, mm-hmm. maybe where you've recognized it, maybe how it's affected your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, I, I think I've answered this question a, a consistent way throughout mm-hmm. the years. And I know part of it is just the path that my life has taken. Yeah. But I would always answer the question that pride was the dominant mm-hmm. sin in my life. Yeah. And it played out in major judgmentalism towards other people. So one example of this was when I was a kid, I can, one of my earliest memories, and it was probably when this played out, not my earliest memory, that would be pretty sad, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> the baby. one of my earliest <laughs> memories is uh, we, we grew up in a house that was at the center of a cul-de-sac. Okay. And Me too. Uh, from, yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah. We didn't live in the same neighborhood. <laughs> no, we didn't. But maybe in an alternate universe or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, So I lived in Maryland. <laughs> and in this, uh, <laughs> this <is laughs> there we go. Story, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in the cul-de-sac, from the front door, you could see every house. Okay. And you could see every front door from my from my view. Okay. So I remember one, one day it just being it just being a downpour. So okay. it was raining like crazy, and it looked like the neighbor two houses over was locked out of their house, and they did not have an awning or a front porch for which to protect themselves mm-hmm. from the rain before whoever got home to let them in. And I can't remember names or anything like that, but I can remember my mom saying, we should let them in so they'll be dry. And I said, no, hmm. because they're smokers. Hmm. And it was because of that pride and judgmentalism wow. that I saw myself as better than yeah. because of the life choices that they had made for themselves. Hmm. And that was wrong right. of me. Right. But that was the separation. Yeah. I was withholding compassion hmm. because of my judgmentalism. Right. And so I was elevating my, my view of myself as hmm. better than this individual yeah. who just needed a warm and dry place to yeah. stay in for a little bit. Yeah. Would we have let him smoke in our yeah. house? Probably not. Yeah. But that judgmentalism was affecting my relationship with them. Yeah. And I'm ashamed to think of the ways mm. that my judgmentalism throughout the years as I've wrestled through it has withheld compassion or, ju- or justice or kindness sure. or grace towards other people yeah. just because yeah. I put myself in a place of superiority. Yeah over them how do you break free from that grace yeah has been mm, it amen. when uh, I, I always say i was 19 years old mm. when i discovered grace for the yep. first time i grew up in church all my life yeah 
but when I heard that I couldn't do anything to make God love me more or like make me love yes, me less and amen. that my sin had killed Jesus, yep. it's like, what? The, I haven't done horrible things in my life. Yes. But it, however incremental I saw my sin, mm -hmm. it was the same in God's eyes mm -hmm. as whatever I described or labeled as a great sin. Yes. Is they were the same yes. in his eyes. And it sent him to the cross. Yeah. And that good. was it to go, oh my goodness. So my judgmentalism is affecting my mm -hmm. relationship with God. And when I learned that even that yeah. didn't keep him from loving me, yeah, good. it started to break down yeah. the walls there. Yeah, that's good. Um, mine's a little bit similar, and I'll share that here. But um, I grew up in church and mm -hmm. grew up, always felt loved and known. And um, I was good. I didn't ever identify as a sinner. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's good. But at that time in my life, and um, I think I was above, it was pride. But it was the Bible study that mm -hmm. you and your wife, Abby, mm -hmm. led. Yeah. Um, and we met after college, uh, as people who graduated from college. That was 10 years ago. Uh -huh. Isn't that weird? Yeah. 10 years ago, we went through the book of Luke. But it was through that group um, and studying the scripture, prayer together, mm -hmm. that kind of intentional community. And I don't know if you remember this, but we read a verse in Galatians 5. Um, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. Mm. Yeah. And something about that verse in particular, that it was like you hear something 100 times and 101st yeah. time. Right. I was like, I must not be walking by the spirit because hmm. um, I satisfy the desires of the flesh all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was that conversation. And I remember, though, um, I don't know if you remember this, but I remember I felt this crushing weight of sin because mm -hmm. you're you're awake to it. Yep. And it was a crushing shame um, and it was debilitating. And I remember I was like, why <laughs> my I'm just like a why mm -hmm. question asker. Why? Like, why would God do this? And um, why would he send his son? Um, and I remember you said, um, he loves us because he created us and it was as simple as that yeah and so we walk forward in that in that love and not yep. in shame and in the cleansing so um thank you for that mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Your influence on my yeah. life so um okay so we've we've defined sin okay. and we've kind of touched a little bit on uh, what to do with it <laughs> so mm -hmm. we, we've recognized sin yep. so what do we do with it now and uh, so jason kind of talked through three options three c's okay. uh, so let's kind of unpack those so the first is that we cover and hide it and conceal it. Yep. Um, and so we hide it from ourselves. We hide it from God. We hide it from other people. And so when we hide it, we hold on to it. Um, what happens when we hold on to it? Uh, for me personally, it's it, it kind of eats me up inside yes. that I know I've got this hidden yeah. sin that I'm not being honest with yeah. to God or to the person that I have offended. Yeah. Or if I ignore it long enough, mm -hmm. then I become numb to guilt, Yes, which makes me ignorant or it makes, it gives me the ability to ignore my sin. And as we've been talking, the idea that sin divides, separates, brings death, yeah. that doesn't mean that it eliminates those effects. Right. I'm just oblivious to the damage that it is yes. doing to my relationship with God and to my relationship with yeah. other people. So that's, yeah, that's kind of when I cover it up, those are the things that. Yeah, that's that good. Uh, let's look at the second C mm -hmm. was confession. Yep. And so Jason was like, there is another way. Yep. We don't have to hold on to this. We don't have to cover it. There's yep. another way. And that's through confession. Mm -hmm. So what's confession? Why do we do it? Yeah. Why is it so hard to do? Yep. How do we do it? Yeah. What's, uh, what's so fascinating about mm -hmm. the word, uh, and I won't be able to bring up the Greek word here, uh, yeah. but the the definition of the Greek word that is used in here is more about agreement than just stating the facts. Yeah. It's agreeing with God about what he says is sin, hmm. which is a huge deal yeah, yeah, because so this like, goes back to the yep. authority of God in our lives. When you make a decision to let, let Jesus be the Lord of your life, hmm. you are in essence saying, I will agree with you hmm about what you say about sin yeah, that's good. in my life yeah. and what I do in my relationships and towards you. And mm. so that agreement is confessing. Mm. So it is acknowledging whether spoken out loud or just in your mind to go, okay, yeah. that was sin. Yeah. And there is probably an apology piece to that, not just agreeing, mm. you know, cause that can be defiant, right? <laughs> right. To go, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah that yeah, was I'm sin and I enjoyed it. <laughs> 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 but to go, yes. okay, yes, I recognize what I have done yeah. is not what you intended for me yes. to do for my life. I'm sorry. 
Yes. So there is that peace. Mm. When you take it a, a step further, Jesus, one of his opening statements in his ministry was, repent mm. for the kingdom of God is here. here. Yep. That repentance is to turn from. I like to think it's like coming home to God. Yeah, that's good. So sin, we have wandered yeah. away. We confess to go, whoa, I've wandered away. What you have said is true. Yeah. Now we'll turn back to you. Yeah. I just made that rhyme. Boom. Yeah. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> so for people listening here, what does confession actually look like? Okay. Like how do they how do they even begin to do that? Right. You don't have to like, like hold place? your hands. Yeah. A certain yeah. Way. Like, is there a yeah. certain way to confess? I think it just starts with honesty. Mm, that's good, yeah. Because you know, whatever tradition that someone is a part of, one tradition may be that you actually have to go to someone, right. a priest, to absolve your sin for right. you. But Jesus is our priest. Mm. He's our priest friend. And he says, come to me, and you have been absolved. You have that's been good. forgiven Amen. of your sin. Yep. So it's this honesty. And it can be spoken out loud. It can be written in your journal. It can be prayed quietly mm -hmm. to yourself. It can be confessed among trusted friends. Yeah, that's good. But it doesn't have that like that magical element to it. Be like I have to find a pastor to confess my sins right. to. You. No, you confess it to Christ. Yes. And yep. He says, "Hey, you're forgiven before you even confess mm. here." Preach. And you receive that. But it's, I think it's a healthy practice, a spiritual discipline of confession. Yes to continue to let that healing power mm -hmm. of God work through mm -hmm. you. That's good. And the final C was conquer, yep. which thank God for that. Um, the penalty for our sin has been paid. Yeah. It's been removed. It's been conquered. So what role does Jesus Christ play in the removing and the conquering of our sin? Yeah, well, I think the first thing is that confession is the mm -hmm. pathway to victory. And there's a, a scripture in First uh, Peter 2, it's 22 through 24, that describes it. Uh, in an incredible fashion, it, it mm -hmm. says, uh, He, Jesus, committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Mm. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Mm. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we mm. might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Mm. So if sin is the sure. ideal to, yeah. to fail to miss the mark, uh, to fail in reaching the goal. Jesus did not fail. Mm. And so he has conquered what we that's couldn't. Good. Yeah, that's good. So when you confess, you are putting your hope for victory in the one who could, uh, in the one who did what we couldn't do Yeah. in that way. And so there is this, this dependency. Yeah. That conf confession is dependency. Mm. It's not just... Uh, re retaining or, or regaining yeah. innocence or yes. some peace of mind, it is a, a step mm. towards victory to go, okay, I my only hope for victory mm. over this sin is you. Because you yeah. defeated death, sin brings death. If he defeated death, then yeah. he's the one who can bring that victory yeah, to our good. lives, our sin yeah. as well. I'm so glad it's not up to us. Yep. Um, well, let's unpack. There's one verse in particular from 1 John 1 that I wanted to unpack. It's verse 9. I'm going to read it. It says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I want to unpack three words from this verse and really focusing on the characteristics of God. Uh, so the first is faithful. What does it mean for God to be faithful? Mm -hmm. um, the second is what does it mean for God to be just? What does that word mean? And then what does it mean that we are cleansed? Okay. So there's a lot here. And... Uh, do yeah, my best like to simplify is yes. both both ideas of faithfulness and justice mm -hmm. is God will do what he says he's going to do. Yes. And he's going to receive what he demands. I don't I don't know if that's yeah. the best way to put it because it's, it's strong language sure. to, to unpack some complex thoughts here. Yeah. But the faithfulness of God is the same mm -hmm. yesterday, today and forever. So. If you look back and go, okay, he forgave mm -hmm. my sins thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. so there is no sin that I could do in the future that is unforgivable mm -hmm. in that way. So that's the faithfulness yeah. of God. The justice of God is that God is holy and righteous. Mm -hmm. And so our sin, there, there's a penalty for our sin, mm -hmm. right? It separates fr from God. We deserve death. Yes. And so, but at the same time, that he is a just God 
who judges with love. And so Jesus paid the ultimate price that we could not pay ourselves. Mm-hmm. And just like the scripture said in Peter, that he, he did not sin, he did not fail. And so he was the perfect representation mm. yep. for us for, to absorb the justice of yep. God yep. in that way, to give us what we couldn't attain on our own. Yeah. And that cleansing yeah. there is, you could think of, of holiness, or a washing mm-hmm. clean, but it's it's standing. Yeah, that's good. It's our standing before God, mm-hmm. is that we are cleansed yeah. through Jesus, n- not on what we have done ourselves. We could scrub our s- skin as clean yeah. as we wanted to, but it would not remove the sin, yeah. the stain of sin yeah. in our lives. Yep. So that's what Jesus's blood has done. Yeah. And there's words in the First John Scripture that would take us into another podcast, but the mm. ideas of atonement and propitiation, sure. yes. Jason which is a that. covering yeah. good. over us. That So when God sees us, he knows we're guilty, but Jesus says, hey, they are forgiven because of what I have done. Yes. That's the justice of God. Yep, there. that's good. That's good. So we've defined sin, and we have acknowledged the role, the inevitable role that it plays in our lives, yep. that we're human, we're imperfect, we're in desperate need of the intervention and the pursuit of God. But also what you just described, that we are cleansed, yep. we are set free, we are wiped clean. So what is the correct view to have of ourselves and how should we see ourselves in the light of how God created us and what he's done for us? Yeah. So a little spoiler alert, we'll sure. get here in some later yep, yep. sermons and yep. podcasts, but First John 3, 1 says mm-hmm. it the best and it's, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, John writes, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Mm. That's it. That's good. That That's is it. what we yep. are. So here's, what, here's the thing that just drives me crazy about Christian culture. Mm. It's this idea. It's like this fixation, this obsession that we have got to label ourselves as worthless sinners. Yes. That's wrong. Mm. That is not an accurate view that God has on us. Mm-hmm. Now, it's true. We are still sinful. Right. And this is part of the, the paradox of John of the of the letter of first john where he'll say hey if you claim to be in christ but you're living however you want to Mm. then you must not be in christ yes we're still going to sin we still have the flesh that we have to to battle with you know Mm -hmm. and we have to you know work our flesh into submission to christ like all those sort of ideas that are taught throughout the new testament but that's not our identity Mm. we we might be children of god who still sin yes but I don't even think God sees us as sinners. No. Mm-hmm. That's a total like blatant uh, exodus from the very notion mm-hmm. of the first two chapters of the Bible, which said we are created in the, the image, image of God, God yep. and that he says we are good. Yep. We may not do what, it, we may not always do what is good, but it's like God is proud of us. He is mm-hmm. proud of his creation. Yeah, so that's good. I, that's the thing that yeah. I just bugs me when I hear people say, yes, oh, me too. I'm just a sinner. Yeah. No, 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 you're not. Yeah. Through Jesus, you were a child of yeah. God. He that's your identity. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, that's really good. Well, Todd, I have one final question for mm-hmm. you. Um, so you've unpacked a lot of deep theological issues here today, and then we've had good conversation about it, but not <laughs> exhaustively. Um, but I want to unpack what digging deeper is okay. and how can people own digging deeper on mm-hmm. their own. Um, for those of us who are just list- for those of you who are just listening, uh, we've got some of our study Bibles out here. Yep. So we'd love to unpack how people can go beyond this podcast and beyond mm-hmm. Sunday morning and kind of dig deeper on their own. Yeah, it's a great question mm-hmm. because this podcast isn't supposed to be the end all be all. Yes. You know, hopefully it's a great tool yep. to you know, to listen to yeah. you know, while you're riding somewhere, exercising, whatever it may be. But hopefully it is a catalyst mm-hmm. to go deeper on your own. Yep. Um, and you don't, it, not everyone can go to seminary, mm. uh, but there are so many tools readily available. So you think, you know, a hundred years ago weren't available yes. to us. And, yep. and it really helps to unpack. And so there are a number of different tools that we can use and just a few that I have. And if you're not watching the video, which you can check out on YouTube, but uh, the one that I go to all the time is a commentary. It's called the for everyone commentary series. It's uh, written by a scholar uh, named N.T. Wright. And I only have the, the gospels in these commentaries. So this one's called Mark for everyone. 
here's the promo plug mm. for that. But I think he's done the entire New Testament. And so you could find First John oh, for everyone. Yeah, that's great. And what he does in the commentary is each entry takes a segment of the scripture and then spends about three pages, no okay. more than that, and gives a cultural example and then applies it to the scripture and then makes an application. Mm -hmm. And the application could be concrete or it could just be a question mm -hmm. that he gives, but that's been so helpful. Mm -hmm. Even in some of the messages I've prepared or Bible studies I've prepared, this has been a go-to commentary. Great. So you can find that wherever you find commentaries. Check out Amazon to begin yes, with. You Amazon. can start with the whole library. Um, another thing that I use in this app is been fantastic. It's called the yes. Blue Letter Bible app and it's got the entire Bible on there along with both the the Hebrew scripture and the Greek versions. Yep. So both of those are there and you can look in and you can click on them and find out what the meanings are and yes. where else in the scripture that they're used. So you can get that app for free. Yep. It's really fantastic. I'm such a word nerd. Yes. Like that is like I love Blue Letter Bible. Yep. So it's a great uh, app. I know a lot of people yep. who use this. Yep. It's a great one to use. Um, I think you have one. Yes. What's yours? So this is my ESV study Bible. This thing is huge. Yep. I don't really often can't carry pick it, it around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to like, yeah, I have to wear a sling here. <laughs> um, but this is one of the best tools to study because mm -hmm. it has pretty extensive study notes uh, for each verse. Um, the beginning of each book, there is uh, history, who it's written to, who it's written by, the context. There's maps. Um, so it really gives you the big collective meta narrative picture yep. um, so that's what I use um, really on a daily basis yep. to study and um, to write things but also just yeah. to study and learn well the thing that we're gonna we're going to naturally do is mm -hmm. we're going to place our cultural context on the scriptures yes. yep. and go oh they must have had McDonald's back then so that's oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when they're talking about yes. cattle they must be talking about the ones that supplied McDonald's with their yep. burgers yep no they did not yes. And so we're often going to misunderstand the scriptures if we just mm -hmm. take our context and place it yes. on their history. Yes. And so that's what the study notes mm -hmm. in a study Bible are going to help you with. And there are so many. I've got a first century study Bible that gives a lot of the first century context yep. in there. There's an archaeological study Bible that gives a lot of the discoveries that they've made oh, cool. uh, in digs and everything like that in oh, the Mediterranean cool. in the Middle East and yeah. things like that, that are applied as well. And Unfortunately, they just can't consolidate them all into, into one. one. Yeah. So they're they're out there, and you can get them uh, on some sort sort of e-reader as well, if mm -hmm. that's kind of your method for that. And then the last thing I would say, in addition to this podcast, one of my favorite new podcasts is the Bible Project yes. podcast. Yep. And uh, you can find them out on online and on YouTube as mm -hmm. well. But the way that they unpack the scriptures both from the language and thematically mm -hmm. is just mind blowing awesome. in a lot of ways. Awesome. So, and how it's all cool. interconnected. Yeah. And they view the Bible, the Bible as one consistent story from awesome. yep. beginning to end. Yeah. And they're able to make the, uh, connect those dots. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing those tools. You got and it. thank you for being here with us today, Todd. Of course. Um, do you Thanks mind closing me. us out in prayer? I'd be happy to. Together? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your scriptures and thank you for the hard work that men and women have done throughout the years, thousands of years, mm -hmm. to preserve these scriptures, both when they were written and how they held on to them as sacred and when they wrote them down. And mm -hmm. it was with us in mind and mm -hmm. our the future generations in mind. And so I pray that you would help the people who listen to this and who are at our churches and in our communities to see the Bible as the Word of God that gives us hope and direction for our lives here and now. Mm -hmm. So I pray that you would uh, help those who listen, who are wrestling with and trying to understand the idea of sin in our lives, that, that they would know that Jesus is the one who has given us victory and forgiveness because of his death and resurrection. And I pray that we would be the ones who continually place our hope and trust mm -hmm. and our confidence in mm -hmm. you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Todd. Thank you guys for listening or watching. We'll be back next week.